um, inventing a pill, a new medicine, that really is, um, it, it's critical you know, to advancing um, care of patients, it's critical for our healthcare, our budget, how can we treat people um, better, um, and it's obviously very financially successful for companies that can take that risk and earn the reward afterwards. So, but the reality is you need about 10 to 15 years, uh, you need over a billion dollars, um, and for every 10,000 potential medicines, um, the start in clinic one will get to the um, patient and, and may help you with the money you've invested. That doesn't deter people. Um, Peplum Biotech um, actually, it started because of a weed grown in Nambour that was shown from a community survey to be um, <coughs> the most uh, commonly cited thing for skin conditions. You rub a bit of radiant weed on your skin. Um, so we were involved in writing the documentation um, of that, um, helping with the clinical trial program, um, and that company was eventually sold um, close to $300 million to a European pharmaceutical company and has um, already obtained great market share for treating skin keratosis, um, sunspots, um, skin cancer, skin cancers over in the US. Uh, Phoenix Eagle, um, again associated with the Innovation Center um, some years back, um, and we have helped with their documentation. They're going as fast as funds will allow, but they've got some really exciting, exciting information coming out from um, science groups over um, in the UK, um, and sitting on some really neat intellectual property there. Um, and they will be sold in the future, but it's just a long, slow road. Um, but they're looking at a chronic disease area, wounds, re um, chronic wounds, um, diabetes, foot ulcers, penis pressure ulcers, those kind of chronic wounds that um, are going to get um, expanded more and more, especially in countries like China. I mean, the world's largest patient population of diabetes is in China, aging populations. So if someone can help those patients for chronic expensive conditions, every 30 seconds people are losing a leg from diabetes in the world, it's a big unmet need. Somebody has to be in that space. Um, and, uh, and, and they are, and, uh, but it's a long, a long road. So I think the biggest opportunities, um, not to discount inventing another pill, but you know, where are the opportunities? And I was struck by a, a, an article in the paper on, on the weekend from Bernard Salt looking at you know, demographic things. And um, you know, the opportunities is gonna be the young, bright things, particularly at the University of Sunshine Coast coming through, hopefully linking with the Innovation Center, people at TAFE, people at the new hospital, how do we, how do we galvanize them? And, and they're called, I don't know, did anybody read this, Kippers? Um, kids in parents' pockets eroding retirement savings. And he talks about, this is the first time where people um, are postponing marriage and mortgage to their 30s because they can take all these risks because mum and dad, they can go back and live with mum and dad. And, and he's really saying that, you know, this is the generation that's gonna innovate and really be quite disruptive in how they innovate because they've got this beautiful safety net that the rest of us um, didn't have. So I think um, there are going to be opportunities and it's going to be the next generation who's really going to be part of that. Now, these are um, trends that um, have been identified as the top 10 healthcare uh, trends um, right for innovation, and this comes from the Drug Information Association um, uh, report. The DIA, as it's called, is the largest umbrella group that brings the government regulators together, the academics, and private industry together. And you can uh, read through what they see as the top 10. The ones that I think are going to be most important and represent opportunities for the Sunshine Coast, industry academic partnerships, uh, patient power, big data, health apps, and global markets. This cartoon, because um, I have to do a bit of brainstorming, so this is my escape clause, that we're brainstorming here and there are no dumb ideas. But if we weren't brainstorming, that would have been a really, really dumb idea. So please forgive me if you think there's really dumb ideas coming out. Um, so industry academic partnerships. Um, here's just some examples. For example, drug discovery. You know, um, in Noosa there was the big biosphere announced from UNESCO and um, and it was how do we as humans live with nature? And, and what are the business opportunities? So it was very commercially focused. It wasn't just you know, out there in terms of environmental factors. 
Um, and I remember being at a, at, a, at a meeting and just listening to people say, well, we could, you know, um, kayak on the river carefully and we could do this. And, and, and to me, um, that biosphere is, um, you know, it could be the potential for new medicine. So this could be the next, where do we drug, do drug discovery? And certainly industry academic partnerships are going to be really heavily focused on looking at what academics are doing to classify, investigate um, these kind of uh, medicines in the making that are in the environment. And we've already seen that through Peplum Biotech and Phoenix, a bit of weed up at Nambour, um, Phoenix Eagle, a bit of pawpaw that they saw monkeys using on wounds in, in the trees. So there are things out there. How do we tap into that indigenous expertise that we have on the coast? 1.5% of the population that the health service um, taps into are uh, indigenous um, people. So how do we really look at that bush medicine? How do we do? Is that an area for drug discovery? Because we've got a lot of things sitting around. Who's going to take that on and then sell that to, um, to uh, the pharmaceutical biotech medical Industry. Non clinical studies is also another area. These aren't really expensive, so um, there's already been Phoenix Eagle has engaged with the USC on some fairly basic mechanism of action studies with the science faculty. So, this is just trying to characterize um, these uh, potential medicines um, how do they work, how do they enter the body, how do they leave the body, uh, and also just non clinical things. If I put this in a bit of a a chemical soup, what happens? And, and those are all very accessible, lower cost studies that could happen and bring industry and academia together. Clinical trials, much more expensive, uh, but also um, much more rewarding. And this is where we really look in a very controlled, ethical way, um, what's the safety profile, the efficacy profile, and also really important now is effectiveness. So a clinical trial done in very stringent conditions, we tell you how well that medicine can work if everything goes well, the patient behaves, the doctor behaves, everything goes well. The effectiveness side is you use it out in the general practice, general community, patients have other conditions associated with that, don't take their pills all the time, what happens? And so this is um, in need um, and it has to be done in a very ethical way, transparent way um, and that is possible. Also, just something different, um, the USC um, served as a, as a catalyst to bring competitors together from industry to do a forum about if you were going to create a wonderful clinical trial center, what would it look like? And that's still in discussion today about how great that meeting was, um, and thanks to Greg Hill for really facilitating that at the USC boardroom. So there's all kinds of things that could happen in that industry academic partnership with the USC and with this health precinct. Patient power is another one. Um, if you look at, um, this is the, the era of the consumer, so whereas before it used to be the doctor doing all the tests and the doctor advising the patient, and this would be a management strategy, now we've got two sides coming together. We've got the doctor doing tests and getting information, and we've got the patient who should also be taking responsibility, and with the advent of biosensors and, and big data, then you're going to have evidence coming from both the patient and the caregiver. And that's going to be really powerful for the first time we can bring genetics, IT, the patient together in that space. Um, and you see things like um, uh, 23andMe, where they're really empowering patients with their genetic testing. Um, and then if you get these genetic tests, what might you have high risk for? And then what are you going to do as a patient in terms of prevention and wellness? So it's not just about giving a pill, it's empowering the patient for their own and they also have 23 and week for app developers. You can go in there and sort of say, okay, what could I do in that space as a healthcare innovator? Um, so patient power is there. Big data is there. So Sunshine Coast, where do we go for that big data? Um, John Lowe from the Faculty of Health Science here crunched some numbers and showed that on the Sunshine Coast, we're actually not all fit um, Aussies. Um, we've got a higher rate of smoking compared to Australia, we've got a high rate of inactivity compared to the rest of Australia. What does that mean for you as innovators? Um, not surprisingly, then we've got a high rate of respiratory disease and a high rate of cardiovascular disease. What does that mean for innovators? What does that mean for prevention and uh, wellness people? Um, it's all sitting there. How are we going to bring the data from the new hospital together with the data in GP land? Um, should we be getting um, data from our chemists? Should gyms be uploading information as to what your workout was and where you went and, and how your body function has been changing? Who's collapsing that for the Sunshine Coast region and making sense of that? 
people want to know that information. It has to be somehow collated, uh, has to be done in accordance with privacy principles. Um, but big data is needed. And we've got you know, patients and consumers having a part. You know, if they're doing their biosensors, where are they uploading that information? Who's looking at it? How is it being used? So if we really want to know in the Sunshine Coast community, if we want to be a role model, we've got this healthcare precinct, how are we engaging with our community so we know what works best and what is affordable for our region? If we've got an aging population, our healthcare bill is going to keep going up. We have to find ways to prevent it so that we really can have that. And then health apps, and I think obviously being in an IT-focused innovation centre, uh, this has great promise, but let me give you a warning. It, the barriers to entry are going to increase. So this is coming more and more under the regulatory spotlight. Um, and just this month, the BMJ uh, uh, took to task um, a few doctors over there that have plagiarized information from a textbook consultant, isn't it? Um, what's really exciting, I don't know if you're aware, if anyone heard about Blue Star? Okay, this is the first FDA cleared um, health app, um, and I'm using that term for you, I think, um, personal, um, Clarified. But this is prescribed. You have to go to your doctor as a diabetes patient and get a prescription for this app. The doctor can help us is then go to download it for the patient. Um, and um, it has been cleared by the FDA. Um, and they will earn $100 per month per patient. So what's the average app sell for? If it sells, if it's not free. <coughs> so $100 per month per patient, and they've got, you know, in the US it's, it's all private healthcare, they've got people lining up uh, to, to bring this on board. Um, they have to convince prescribers, payers, and patients, and so they've actually done randomized controlled trials, a really neat groundbreaking trial for a health app, um, and uh, in line with guidance from the FDA, the TGA has now put out its own guidance about um, regulating health apps. And I can't emphasize enough that if you're in that health app space and you've got anything to do with um, any claims for preventing, diagnosing, monitoring, you really need to be abreast of um, this regulatory advice. Um, Lower cost innovation, instead of inventing a pill, at that um, DIA meeting, um, there's a whole bunch of apps. And so on that table over there, um, you know, if you just read over this, it, it's great brainstorming. There's all kinds of services and, and IT-based healthcare um, applications um, now being sold. So there, there's ripe opportunity. And final thing is the global markets, Australian and Asian century. So, um, you know, I said Proscribe was very much focused on developing track record in Asia. A lot of companies that think they're global, that means Europe and the US. If you can carve out a niche, and there's still time in the Asia-Pac region, I think you're on a real winner. We're, we're time zone, uh, we've got a good reputation in this region, we have to watch how we do business. Um, but say for our business years ago, um, you know, we made sure that we had, um, we've got English versions, we've got um, uh, Japanese versions, simplified Chinese versions, um, I've got a, a Chinese um, name, uh, um and offices, so there's, there's whole bunch of things you have to do carefully in terms of cultural sensitivity to move in that market, but this is where you're really going to get a, a great asset um, if, you, if you can orientate your business towards that. So I'm going to leave it there and hand it on to um, Kirsten, that's the big sort of more brainstorming <coughs> session. No